All right, we're going to start. Um, I'd say enough people came in, but um, just to introduce myself, I'm Jeff Ray. Um, I'm the Digital Projects Librarian at NOAA Central Library. Um, I do a number of things, uh, which most notably I host this webinar series. Uh, so, sorry, um, but let's just get into this. Um, so today this is the second session of the webinar series and today we're going to cover um, visualizing data, most um, primarily mapping data, and then we are going for the second portion we're going to cover uh, NetCDF files. And so just to get started right away for this portion of visualizing uh, mapping data, um, and specifically in our case, we're going to be focusing on uh, national data, buoy center data. So let's let's hop into it. Uh, the library specifically, we're covering our uh, Siphon, which is a Python library package that you are able to use to remotely access data um, uh, through uh, thread servers, if you're familiar with those, and additional web services. Um, and for the second portion, again, we'll be using Siphon as well to access uh, NetCDF files. And the second library we will um, use in particular is uh, for this portion is Cardopy, which is a really good package for um, producing map and performing uh, data analysis on uh, geospatial uh, data. So let's, uh, so just to recap, because I think this is important as Cardopy um, leverages, and I should say more specifically, Cardopy kind of builds on top of these libraries in particular. It builds on top of Mapplotlib, um, which I'll get into detail, but the libraries we uh, covered on Tuesday in the first session were NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib. And if you did not actually attend those first, um, attend that first session, you could either look at the notebooks or the um, uh, watch the the video, which will eventually be posted if it has not been posted already on the library's YouTube page. And so to kind of get into the code portion. Before we actually start to look in the individual notebook cells, I would ask that everybody run all the cells at once, because I know in the first session there were some issues when I didn't actually explain how to do that. So to do that in Jupyter, uh, which we're using, you want to go under the kernel menu where my cursor is and go to restart and run all cells. And so once you do that, you'll see this little prompt if you're in Jupyter, and you'll hit reset or restart. And so this might take a little while on your machine, um, but if everything goes to plan, there should be no errors. And you could just do a quick scroll through. I'm not going to go too fast because that might be disorienting, disorienting for any uh, people. It is for myself. Um, you could ignore this. Uh, prompt here, but you just want to go through your entire notebook and make sure you're not seeing any errors. Um, this notebook isn't particularly long. We'll cover all this material, but you just want to make sure you're not seeing any red prompts. Um, and then you want to go back up to uh, this initial uh, cell with all these import statements. And so if you do see any um, any errors, I would say just drop, uh, put your questions in the question box, and I will get to them the next time I ask uh, uh, for any questions. Um, but so now that we've we've done that, um, we'll t we'll jump into this portion about what this block is. And so, as a reminder of what went on with the first session, Python has import statements. And so an import statement allows you to import a number of additional Python libraries that you will use for um, your program or in this portion um, for our notebook. And this allows 
us to grab additional function or access additional functionalities. Um, and importantly for this uh, notebook, we want to import uh, matplotlib, um, matplotlib's pyplot uh, module. Uh, that will allow us to utilize uh, cardoply, cardopy, uh, uh, ultimately. Um, and we'll also import other libraries, OS, Daytime, and uh, Pandas, and NumPy. Um, in addition, we're going to um, set options to only display a certain number of rows with pandas. That's not really necessary in this case, but I always like to throw that out if you work with pandas or you think you will work with pandas as a command line. In addition, we will also set the figure size for um, plots um, in this manner. Um, this allows us this is specifically in the case of Jupyter. Um, if you're going to be using it in programs outside of Jupyter, you don't necessarily need to do that. Um, now to actually talk about uh, Siphon, um, the library that was developed by uh, UCAR, um, UCAR's unit data. Um, it's used, again, for downloading data um, from remote services. Um, and I actually, if you hover over Siphon, you can uh, get to the documentation. I'm not going to click on that, but feel free to do that to explore later. And so, and to actually now get to uh, national, uh, getting data from National Data Buoy Center, um, the way to do that is we want to import the class from National Data Buoy Center. And so to break down how, what this import statement is, is we're actually, Importing um, the national data, a national uh, buoy, national data buoy center module from uh, Siphon's web service module, um, and there's dot notation for doing that. Um, we're not necessarily going to cover it. import statements within this um, within this portion of this session, but um, I will be providing information about import statements within a document that I follow up with all these sessions. And so we import this statement. And before I go any further, I, I forgot to mention um, that when you run cells, while we did run all cells, when you want to run a cell individually, you want to hit um, return plus shift. So this will allow you, as you can see, the blue um, portion, this little blue box tab. This means you're, and you'll see the little, uh, the numerical value update. This means that uh, everything is success, that your cell has run successful. And so now that we have imported this uh, class, we're able to get data. So we're, we're working on getting data. Um, and so what we do is we, with uh, Siphon's uh, ability to get data, we're going to import latest observations. And so we import this, and we get latest observations for um, a number of buoys. And so I only printed out the five, and it prints it out in a pandas data frame. While I'm only printing out um, the first five with uh, pandas head uh, method, I could print out all of them if I wanted to. Um, but I need to actually print that out. Um, and you will see a whole list. And at the bottom, you can see that there's 726. Um, and so you can see that there's a, a, um, this service allows for a lot of, of the ability to um, easily grab a lot of information fairly quickly. But for us, the, the purpose of this portion of the webinar, uh, we want to actually do some visualization. And so um, as, as, what, as what occurred in the last uh, session, we wanted to, um, as I showed with pandas, you can easily visualize information. You don't actually need to directly access matplotlib. Uh, pandas allows you to do that. So what we're going to do is this um, data frame has lat and long values, and so we're going to easily access that uh, using pandas. And so we do this with um, uh, pandas and matplotlib, which is um, 
which pandas can leverage. And so we grab the long, uh, long values and the lat values, and we set the plot as a scatter plot um, kind. That's the argument. But as we see, it prints it out, and you know this isn't entirely useful. Say if you want to use this for a publication or on a website or whatever purpose. So here comes the power of CardoPy. We actually want to set this to a projection, um, whatever that projection is. And so, what exactly is CardoPy? CardoPy is used to generate maps using Python and uh, perform data analysis. Um, if anybody's familiar with uh, plotting with uh, uh, plotting uh, maps with Python using base map, this CardoPy is replacing this. The main developer of base map has said that before. And um, again, I have the documentation linked uh, here. I'm not going to go into it, but I will go into the different map projections that CardoPy offers through. Um, so let's go there really quick. I should say I will go there for you. Um, so here we go. Here is the documentation. And on the right, we have the projection list. And if you're a cartographer or familiar with projections, you may see some that you recognize and you may be interested in investigating further. And so we are going to go back and we will see that um, we will get into projections in a second, but I just want to show you the import statement again. Um, in Python, you'll get familiar with this if you're not a Python programmer. So what we need to do is import CardoPy's coordinate, coordinate reference system. And like Pandas and NumPy, CardoPy has a convention that has been developed of using uh, an alias of CCR. CCRS instead of you know typing out cardopi.crs. And so we import this. And so to show how to do a basic uh, projection without any data, which we'll get to uh, relatively soon, we, uh, we, we set our projection in a variable. We don't always have to do that, but it's much easier, as we'll show in a second. And then we um, set a uh, we create our um, geoaxis, which um, base, it's a subclass of matplotlib's uh, axis. Um, so if you don't know what that means right away, um, I didn't know right away, and it took me a second to kind of remember it. But one thing you should remember is that matplotlib uh, uses an axis to um, create the plot within the figure. And so kind of cardopi leverages are built on top of um, matplotlib. And so there's a lot of similarities. Uh, so if you've watched the webinar on Tuesday, you'll see some similarities fairly quickly. But so what we want to do is set our, add our projection as an argument into the geo axis. And so we have the Mercator or a projection, and then we just set it in there and we set coastlines and this uh, sets, sets up, allows you to essentially see uh, the, the coastlines of our map projection. And then we run it and we see it. And when I say see the map, if you take away that argument with a comment, it goes away. And so let me um, bring the map back. And as I said, it's always nice to set your projection as an uh, variable because you could quickly update it and also in programming it's always good to kind of set you know values as variables because you don't want to hard code things in anyways so now that we know how to set maps or create maps we want to add data because that's uh, data to our maps because you know that's that's very helpful and that's kind of a teleological statement, but um, so let's do that. But before doing that, there's one very important thing to remember is that CardoPy kind of separates um, data, the data uh, coordinate system from the, um, the plot or the, you know, the, the maps coordinate reference system and it keeps those, uh, 
keeps those two things separate. And you need to be very aware of that whenever you're plotting data onto maps. And uh, before I get any further, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to look at the questions and see if anybody, which it looks like there are some questions. So let's see. So um, there, the, there's one question, what web service uh, module to, uh, is there to import data from NCEI? Um, there are, um, this is a very kind of open question, I would say, but I would say that Siphon does, does offer the ability, um, does allow that ability to import um, or allow access to NCI web services. Um, like Siphon does have a threads class, a threads module. I think it's, I'll, I'll get to that in the second portion of this webinar. And that will allow you to download uh, NetCDF files. And in addition, I'm not going to cover it, but it will, you don't always have to download. You can remotely access NetCDF files. Um, there's also just basic REST um, libraries I'm not going to cover, but uh, like a request or I think it's URL lib2. There's, there's variations on URL lib. Um, so I would say those are um, potential abilities, I think. For me, who's someone who does a lot of scripting and doesn't necessarily uh, access uh, like climate data um, on a regular basis, I'd say NCI or NOAA in general, the tricky part is actually finding those access points. Um, so the second question is, is it possible to use color mapping for the, uh, the data points in um, Cardo Pi. Um, I yeah, you can. Um, I'm going to get to that later on. How you could apply specific color maps, and um, you could it essentially utilizes. Uh, it does utilize Matplotlib's uh, color maps, and I did not provide a lot of information in this webinar, but I can follow up in more detail with Matplotlib's color map information. Uh, especially in reference to um, accessibility, there was a visualization kind of movement. I think it's called End the Rainbow um, to kind of stop using any color maps that were bad for people that had color blindness. Um, uh, yet, can you add coordinate long lat info to the plot? That's actually what I'm going to do next. Um, I believe if that's what your question is. Um, yeah, and I'm going to get into that right now. So that's that's what I mean when I started to talk about um, uh, transform and projection keywords. So let's let's do that right now. All right. So um, so as I was talking about, Matplotlib separates the data. Um, data's coordinate reference system and uh, the plot's coordinate reference system. And so what we're going to do is use that buoy information um, that we have in a data frame, Panda's data frame, and we're going to add it to a plot that we created. And so we're going to use this azimuthal equal distant uh, um, plot in our case, and we're going to add the buoy data on there. And so in this particular case, I picked this one because if you don't add the, the coordinate reference system for the data uh, using the transform word or transform uh, argument, it's not actually going to show up at all. Um, so what we do is, like before, I'm going to scroll up slowly. Um, we add, actually, I don't need to scroll up slowly. Um, we create the projection uh, within a, a variable, uh, we create a plot, um, and we set the figure size, and then we create the geo-axis, adding the projection uh, into the geo-axis axes, and then we uh, create the coastlines, allowing us to see the, the actual map, if you will, 
And now we add the buoy data in there, the long lat values. We set a color, in this case I chose blue, and then using the transform um, argument, um, we set, uh, we use uh, the plate, plate curry, please uh, let me know if I'm pronouncing that wrong, um, because I'm gonna say that probably a few more times. And once, and we're also going to set global, uh, that essentially if you have data, it will show the entire plot. Um, and then we run this, and as you see, even before it's done explaining, you can see the every all the um, buoy data is plotted correctly. Um, so what I will show you is if I remove the transform or a keyword, um, it's not there anymore. I think there's a, there's some information there where my cursor is but it's not actually plotted properly. And one of the other tricky things is if you use, um, if you use a uh, certain projections, I think it's like a Lambert conformal, and then you don't actually pass uh, in plate curry for like long lat data or uh, certain data, it's, it looks like it may be uh, correct in some cases, but it's slightly off, and you um, and you could run into some trouble there. So um, it's very careful that you always use the transform um, keyword. So in this case, I actually used um, play curry, um, and I didn't pass the transform, and it works, but um, I would always say use uh, transform, even if both the map, even if the plot and the data have um, the same projection uh, coordinate reference systems, just as a, a good um, good measure. Um, and I believe uh, that's even what the documentation says. And just I think in general with Python, it's always good to be explicit rather than be implicit. Um, so. Uh, I, I mentioned the word, I mentioned the, um, this set global method. So I'm gonna use this now, as you can see, there, it's not showing the entire um, map. So when you have data, you plot data, it kind of just reduces down to show the visible data um, within the map. So, but if you wanna see the whole map, this is what you get, you get everything, so. So now we are going to go and add more features because as you can see above, it's kind of plain. And um, say if you want to create a map for a publication, you want to add you know, uh, the actual coordinates to the map and other features. So CardoPy has a features um, a module um, component. So what you want to do is you want to import features our feature and you want to uh, label or you want to use the alias. This isn't necessarily a convention as much as uh, uh, C C R S is. And so however it is, more, it is relatively convenient to label it with some kind of alias. And so we import this. And as you can see before, we want to um, create, you know, create our, our, add our projection to a variable. We want to create the figure, add the projection into the geo axis. And in this case, we are going to set um, the map scale to um, 50 million, and we are going to add edge color. I actually think this is redundant. Um, we could take this out and see. But I would, uh, one of the main points I wanted to do with that situation and with all these other um, uh, additional arguments is to show, um, show, show the ability or show that CardoPy has a lot of um, additional functionalities and essentially sprucing up your map. Um, and so, again, this, this example was about adding features. So in this case, to add a feature is when you, you access it through um, ocean, if you want to add um, color to the map, 
you do so, and if you want to set the scale for the ocean, you do so um, here with width scale, and you add land. And so, as you will see, I'm just going to jump down here. I'm going to run it first. You will get, you know, land will produce this uh, teal. I don't know what is that kind of a beige, beige and blue. But the main reason blue is light blue is I have alpha, and I take that off. Um, for me, that's a little dark because I have all the buoys on there. Um, set global, and then um, what I did is I also added grid lines to get the grid lines and then um, draw labels. I thought that was important to highlight to actually get the coordinates. And I should point out that not all um, coordinate reference systems have uh, the ability to draw labels. And so like before, we plot the data and we use transform even if we did not need to in this case. And importantly, um, for those that weren't here on uh, Tuesday, you save a figure by using plot.savefig. And what we're gonna do now is, since I actually saved in a specific folder and I named it, um, I used kind of a dynamic way to name it with now using the date time module um, and set the DPI for 300. We'll show you what like a finished product looks like. Um, we're going to scoot over here fairly quickly. Um, and so this is what you get outside of Jupiter. Um, I think it looks relatively well, um, relatively good. And so now, now we got like a, a big overall picture. What we want to do is subset the data and look at a specific area. In this case, we're going to look at the south, U, uh, southeastern U.S., Gulf of Mexico area, um, and specifically we want to focus on water temperature. Um, but what we want to do is we want to drop all the buoys that don't have any water temperature values. And so we are going to uh, go back to pandas because that's where our data is located in, which is within um, a data frame, but before we do that, I'm going to answer, I'm going to ask, answer some questions. Um, so, so there's a, I thought 50 uh, million for coastline is resolution. There are, um, with features, you could set resolution for land, ocean, um, you could set it for, um, whatever feature you access it. Um, and so, let's see. Are there plans, um, are there plans in the future to demonstrate Jupyter Lab and loading features um, from the NOAA GIA platform? Um, there currently are not, um, it would be nice to have something like that, I mean, I know NOAA has like data thons, but I think they kind of, they love their Esri products. Um, we might want to bleep that out. <laughs> um, uh, so is it possible to use a web map service for imagery? Um, not in this, um, I know, uh, not that I wanted to actually use something from, I think uh, Siphon has something built into it to allow you to retrieve stuff, uh, images from a specific um, uh, a NASA web service, or relies on um, a source, a NASA service, but Siphon currently, uh, that is broken. Um, I wanted to, um, but, um, I could I could try to look into something and try to like uh, again I, I I am working on a document to try to add um, answer these questions outside the webinar but I'm glad you asked that so we will get on um, with subsetting the data and looking at a specific uh, area outside of our beyond a global view so 
as I said, we are going to kind of focus on water temperature within uh, the southeastern U.S. Um, and so what we do is we want to drop all the buoys that are not, um, that don't have water temperature data and for our information. And so what we do is we use the drop NA um, uh, method and we select the water temperature column because that's within the data frame. And we use this in place additional argument, true, and that will allow us just to run it on the same data frame object. We don't have to create another object. Uh, and what I mean by that is we don't have to um, do to give you some. We don't have to do something like that where it creates like a. That's that's kind of the advantage of using in place. So I'm not actually going to run that because um, then I have to change all the code below. But so we have our our subs we have our um, essentially cleaned up data with no water temp with our any with our our updated data frame, and so to kind of focus on the southeastern area, um, Gulf of Mexico area, we are going to use this extent. Um, we're going to add this new extent uh, uh, variable, and so we're going to utilize that by passing it into um, the set extent method um, and the bounding box essentially. And what it does is it focuses on the specific area of the map. It creates a map and it's essentially a subset of visualization. And so now we have a more granular focus. Um, but now we want to now we want to focus on it further uh, even more, and or we want to analyze it even more um, because we have the buoys, and we want to actually see what these values mean or get some um, uh, better ability to um, to actually assign some meaning to them. Um, and to do that, we'll create a color bar. Um, unfortunately, because I used a uh, Cardopy slash matplotlibs um, uh, object oriented way of creating maps. We kind of have to go about this in a, I would say, a convoluted way. But essentially, we're going to create a, a color bar um, object. And what we do is we have to, and what hopefully some of this code is starting to look a little, little familiar, are the patterns. But what we need to do is we need to create this uh, color bar axis. And then in addition to creating, and we create a few other variables, we need to get the water temperature minimum, the water temp max, and we will use that within our color bar um, axis. And then uh, so what we do is we um, I will admit it's even kind of a little much looking at it and talking to everybody right now. It's a lot of information to take in at first and even going over with everybody. But we'll create the color bar here. We create the object and we pass it in the color bar and we get this. We get a nice little color bar here. So now we know, you know, values up here are obviously you know going to be you know cooler but values down here are going to be warmer and so that's you know that's kind of the advantage of having color bar we could assign values and remember what is here you know what's hotter down there warmer down there and what you know what the actual values are um, so now that we actually have a map that you know has some meaning behind it, and we can immediately look at it and see what's going on, say we want to further analyze um, those values, we we have that extent bounding box in a Python list. Um, what we could do is get that um, get that information. So what we do is we grab a uh, we use pandas once again. Um, and as it is a list, 
we could use up uh, Panda's kind of Boolean, um, I think it's a Boolean masking uh, technique. And we kind of, I would say, it could be a little tricky to look at again, and maybe you have to kind of parse it out or space it out. And we pass it in, and we get these specific values here um, returned. And so we get these, and also we get the specific buoys that are within this map. So now I'm going to uh, look at some of the questions. And uh, uh, so I see. Um, so I should say that uh, our, the question is, our, um, is Siphon Web Service only available for Wyoming? Um, I stayed. Uh, so Siphon is a, does not um, has specific web services. I I don't know all the web services offhand, but yes, they they do offer a limited availability in web services. It is. Um, it is a library created by Unidata, and um, so they're not like, a, yeah, they specifically um, have created like specific web services. Yeah, um, you would have to, it sounds, it, I'm inferring that you looked into their documentation, but yeah, um, it's not kind of like a Python's like request library where it, you could just go out and grab any web service. All right. Um, just I'm going to grab some water for a second. So now we're going to go into uh, something a little different is uh, do some time series analysis with National Buoy Data Center uh, real time observations. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to grab specific buoys as opposed to a large amount of buoys. And so what we're going to do is we're going to grab this buoy for uh, 1008. And um, using Siphon again, we're going to do the, you're going to use the real time observation web service. And so, uh, like before, the service. Uh, when you request it, uh, as a result, it creates a pandas data frame. Um, we can actually ignore, or everybody can actually ignore this uh, pressure uh, DF2, data frame two, uh, this statement here. Um, that, that was a little, that was a misstep by me. I did not catch everything when I created these notebooks. Um, we could run it. Um, we could, sorry about that. Uh, typo. Uh, we could run it. We get this, we get the results here. Um, and so we see that everything is good. Um, again, if, if anybody's having trouble, let me know at this point. Um, and so I put this uh, pandas plotting. I'm going to check to see if anybody. Oh, let me see. There's a question. I'm checking questions for a moment. Uh, where'd the questions go? Uh, just one moment. I'm looking at questions. So I mentioned it was tricky to find access points to import data from different ac different uh, places within NOAA. Um, so I could try to do that, but I could just, when I mention that, I, I want to kind of mention that I am an individual who doesn't work with climate data. So um, I could mention offhand, like for this webinar, I got stuff together. I at first was kind of all over the place. I do sometimes work with individuals from NCI, specifically uh, some members who work with OER, if ocean exploration program. So 
I I kind of rummaged around on um, their uh, geo, uh, some of their like landing pages to find uh, NetCDF files, and then I I talked to someone and they pointed me to their thread server. Um, I have a link in there, and we'll get to the threads uh, information later. Um, I found information on class. Um, if anybody's that's the large array storage system. Um, but yeah, I could work on, I think you may have to follow up with me to ask what you're actually looking for because NOAA offers so many data products. So yes, please just email me and maybe we could talk about this offline. Um, so getting into um, actually working with specific data and doing time series analysis, uh, matplotlib allows you uh, we need to, uh, so I mentioned this uh, pandas plotting uh, uh, little uh, module. This, I would not worry about getting into this too much. Um, I put this in here because I believe there's some daytime issues between matplotlib and pandas, and you'll get an error if you don't import this. Um, uh, so we also want to import the matplotlib dates module and these two classes, because they'll allow us to format the dates, dates on the x-axis. Um, so like before, we're going to create a some plots using uh, matplotlib's um, object-oriented uh, style. And however, what's notable this time is we're going to create twin x-axis uh, um, axes. So what we do is we create this little, uh, we create the object and we, uh, we add this twin X method. And so we will label, uh, we will later use that. And so using, um, of like before of matplotlib, we did on Tuesday, we create the title and importantly, we're going to create a line plot, line plot, and so we run the line plot um, uh, method, and we add our data frame data, accessing the time column, the pressure column, set color, and we set our label, our Y label, um, and then also the matplotlib. We want to format our x-axis date information. As you can see, my cursor goes over it. We're going to format it this uh, to show just the day, um, the day and the month. We don't want to see the year, and so we do that with our first plot. We do that with our second plot because we're subplotting, and we format again, and then we add our um, we add our uh, x label, or we add our y label and our second y label, and so. We added two x-axis um, data here, and we added two y labels here. And so, while this this looks uh, relatively nice for doing uh, relatively little work, I would say, grabbing real-time information and plotting it. Um, I will let you guys do the science behind it. I just I did the plotting. Um, <laughs> so. Now we are going to um, further um, customize it. Um, basically, just showing that we um, this is just basically a follow-up to add some more information. Um, we are just going to add grids to it, and I just want to stress here is that more information you add. Um, it makes sense to kind of say uh, maybe. I'm using matplotlib's object-oriented methods, our approach. Maybe I should either add it and take this approach using a function or a loop, which I'm going to uh, do so in a second. Um, and so, yes, I'm going to take the function uh, loop approach in a second, but first I'm going to answer some questions. Um, how do I differentiate the two data series? Um, so basically what I'm doing is I, um, the question was how do I differentiate the, 
differentiate the two data series. Um, I'm differentiating them by um, separating each two. Uh, if, are you speaking in a sense of um, for the, I'm assuming you're talking about the weather temperature and the air temperature, or are you talking about the pressure and um, Um, so we could actually, um, if we want to differentiate, uh, weather and air, that's actually a really good point. I was going to, um, we could do color. This was something I was going to do earlier. Um, we could add a color argument. I hope this is the correct way to do it. I did it actually yesterday, but I did not. Um, we don't want to have them both be the same color. Um, we could do this. It, we, you may want to do some additional adjustment. Um, that way, um, because for me, I would say this is kind of hard to read. Um, I don't know offhand how to make a bold, but that is a one way to, to differentiate them. Um, and that is actually something I did not take into consideration for the, the next example. Um, but I will, um, I could potentially work on that, not live, but um, uh, in a follow up. So we have this uh, example, but as you can see, it's kind of, um, kind of, uh, if we want to further update it, there's a lot of a duplication. So what we do is we, um, we're going to add this in a loop. Um, we're going to use iteration as the example says, uh, which is the loop. And so we're going to do it with two buoys, um, furthermore. Um, and so when you want to say reduce your code, you can use a loop, but not only when you want to reduce your code, you're going to have to also utilize, um, uh, you're going to have to reduce the hard coding in your code. And so in this case for us, we're going to have to create more variables. We're going to have to pack those uh, values into lists. So the plot uh, variables, um, these are the Y variables and then the color information, we're going to have to um, put it into a dictionary. Um, and then we're going to also, but before we create the loop, we're going to um, take a sip of water here. We're going to create a subplot and um, subplots you when you do this you need to add um, the number of rows and the number of columns i hope i did not get that wrong um, and also you need to get the figure size um, and so we we're actually going to do uh, three loops which is this uh, a bit confusing at first but in doing that we're going to be able to iterate all over these values and in doing so, I'm going to jump down to show you the results if you haven't already peeked. Um, and um, what it essentially does is, while well, not going through everything, because I realize we're running late on this portion, is we pack everything, we pack these, we create multiple axes, um, which are the plots, and we create the, and we pack, um, and then we just, we're not hard coding the information in anymore, and we actually add it in here. Um, and what I wanted to stress here, I did this before the webinar, is we do this, what is actually going on, or what the, the important point beyond uh, on this aspect is that um, this is actually how we, um, how we set the, the values and create the plots is matplotlib, um, cardopy has this ability to create uh, plots or subplots by um, uh, using this notation or this, uh, this system of just, these are individual plots 
and you set it this way. So each plot is created this way, and we set these values um, uh, in this manner. Um, if I had some more time, I could probably go into more detail, but I, I just want to get to the next section. Um, fortunately, that, that was the last section, uh, portion, so I'll let anybody ask questions. But um, so please ask some questions, and I will uh, then uh, go over these resources. All right, um, the resources here are um, tutorial on CardoPy, um, and importantly, uh, I think for a lot of people that are doing climate um, climate data visualization or mapping, MetPy Monday uh, Unidata. Um, uh, covers uh, a lot of information that may be relevant for you. They cover um, how to create basic plots. I know the last example was kind of more complex um, than uh, other examples I've gone over. Um, there's also siphon and overview. Um, uh, there's Importantly, if there's a, I should don't want to say importantly, but the library has a Python libguide. It provides resources related to a lot of the stuff we've gone over so far. Um, in addition, Commerce Learning Center, they have a resource for programming videos. Um, and if you're fed, you could automatically sign up. Um, and if you're a contractor, you could get your federal manager to uh, sign you up if it's within the scope of your work. Um, I see there's a question. So um, so um, can Maplot live, the question is, can Maplot live with CardoPy support real-time 3D rotation in a figure? Um, I could actually, I, I may be able to get an answer. I think there was I don't want to say a definite yes, but I think someone that was an intern at did a science on a sphere project in uh, College Park, and I think they possibly used uh, uh, Python. I don't know if it was uh, real time, but um, I could follow up with someone that works in that library where the science on the sphere is, and I could get back to you on that. Um, so I will do that for you. Um, let me see, there's another one. You're welcome. Uh, all right, uh, so I'm gonna take a sip of water before this one. Um, mm. All right, so we're gonna get into NetCedia files. I, I will preface this by saying this is not an explainer on NetCedia files. Um, this is not necessarily explainer on CF conventions. Um, uh, I'm not necessarily someone that works with NetCDF files all the time. So, um, but I can provide you resources if you contact me about um, where to find uh, CF convention information or um, NetCDF information. Um, so please email me if you have such, uh, such questions. Um, so again, we're going to go, the libraries we're going to go over are Siphon. We've kind of touched on that already. Um, uh, NetCDF4, it's an interface to NetCDF files, allows uh, reading and writing of uh, NetCDF files. In X-Array, um, I believe it was previously called X-Ray, um, and it's tailored specifically working for NetCDF files. Um, so, Siphon allows you um, to, uh, in this context of this uh, portion of the webinar, it allows you to read from Threads servers. Um, and uh, again, I have a link for the documentation. And so, for this example, um, I you know, of course, it's a controlled um, example situation. I'm using uh, uh, some uh, data from uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, I just grabbed this from NCEI's GeoPortal. I couldn't think of it, what it was earlier. 
and I'll remind everybody, um, as this is, uh, if you haven't opened this notebook yet, to uh, go to the tab kernel and run restart and run all cells. This is especially important if you um, may not have, I ask for everybody to install certain libraries and if you don't have um, uh, X, X-Array installed, so it's important to see that that is uh, installed are all other libraries. And just check if there are no errors. I'm quickly scrolling through um, to make sure that everything is OK. And so we are back at the top. Um, so like before, we are going to import um, something from uh, Siphon. But this time, we're going to import the, the TDS catalog, the threads catalog from Siphon. And so once we have that imported, we are going to access uh, threads data um, from NCEI. So this is an NCEI um, specifically in a subdirectory in a threads data catalog. Um, I noticed that this, so if everybody wants to change, if everybody's at this point, when it changes to cat from SST cat and then hit enter, shift enter, these are all the files that are available on that specific uh, subdirectory. That's a lot. So that shows you like an easy way to access. But we are going to comment that back out. Um, and you can hit shift enter again. And we're going to access the first um, NetCDF file here for our example. And um, you can see that I just wanted to verify that this is a um, data set, siphon uh, data set. And then um, for later perp for convenience, I also wanted to create a variable with um, the file name. And I saved this uh, data set within a specific directory um, and save that as uh, file, um, file or I downloaded that. So when I download it, it goes into that directory. Um, and so now we have, now we're, um, now we're moving into actually using the NetCDF for Python library. Um, this was also created by, I believe, yes, um, Unidata. They do a lot of work um, for uh, working with uh, um, a lot of science, Python scientific libraries. Um, if you haven't at this point, uh, check them out. Um, I would imagine uh, possibly people have and you're interested in Python, you may want to check them out to see for whether it's relevant, relevant for your work to do so. Um, so I import the data set class from NetCDF4, um, and this will allow me to um, create a, uh, uh, a NetCDF object within um, NetCDF4 and allow me to actually start um, viewing or manipulating the information within NetCDF4. Um, but I just wanted to kind of digress for a second. Um, to actually just get a little view using the netcdf uh, dump command um, and also show a feature of Jupyter I did not show previously. If you want to run commands that are um, within your operating system, I'm not sure if everybody has this, but you just use the exclamation mark. Um, so if I wanted to print out a list like within my system, I could just use uh, uh, this uh, exclamation mark and ls, and it would print out documents, or it would just print out a list of the files in the current directory. But uh, ncdump um, h to get the headers of the netcdf file, and it prints out everything. And we can see the netcdf file we will be working with. Um, and so, now we are going to use the NetCDF4 um, library to inspect um, 
aspects of um, the NetCDF file. And so at first, we're just going to look at the, the variables within the NetCDF file. We get, you know, time, lat, uh, long, uh, uh, sea surface temperature, uh, sea surface temperature, um, and then uh, fill missing QC. Um, and then we want to expect it inspected dimensions. Um, we see that um, we get the keys here, or we get the values, because these are within, uh, dimensions are stored within Python dictionaries, and we could loop over them using Python's uh, uh, dictionary items method. And so we get that here. And so, um, we also, if you want to access the attributes of a specific variable, you could use the NC uh, attributes or NC ATTRS um, uh, method, and that will get the attributes of a specific um, variable. Um, and we're going to focus primarily on sea surface temperature of this uh, file throughout the rest of the um, session. And so, we loop through everything and we get the key value pairs to um, for all the variables. So this is just a kind of a lot of information, but I just wanted to show you how easy it is to grab stuff um, using Python's uh, NetCDF4. And so now we are going to get the data. And so um, we do that. Uh, we're going to store it as a um, object. Um, by assigning it to a variable. And so what we do is um, we access the variable and then we access the data directly. And um, as this file has, um, we just want to get the first time period. There's eight time periods. Um, as you can see, I'm going up quickly. Um, we just want to get the first time period. So uh, if you remember, our um, this we're using panda our NumPy's notation of um, indexing multi-dimensional arrays. So let me actually do this to kind of clarify what is going on, because sometimes it helps to see examples. <laughs> um, so shape. Uh, you can see that it's a three-dimensional um, array, NumPy array. That's how uh, NetCDF four stores values, and so we are going to get the first um, first value here, and then we're going to get these val all these values. And so you can see how easy it is to. Um, of course, I'm showing simple. Um, operations, but we could get the mean of um, sea surface temperature. We could get the standard deviation, and then we get the size, how many items are in sea surface temperature. And then I'm going to show a visualization with uh, X-Array, but I just, so we're going to close this because it's good to release it from uh, memory. You don't want to, uh, especially if you're going to continue on. Um, and so we close this file. Um, let me make sure that I'm actually running everything. And so um, X-Array, uh, while you could do a lot of this stuff in NetCDF4, um, I think X-Array, um, again, I don't work with uh, NetCDF files uh, in general. I should say X-Array, from my understanding, is may be more preferable as you could work, um, you could access information a little easier and you could carry out operations uh, a little easier. Um, if anybody out there actually does does use these libraries, uh, feel free to chime in or if there are any questions, just uh, feel free to ask them now. Um, so, X-Array borrows heavily from pandas, um, but it's uh, designed for multi-dimensional arrays. Um, uh, and also X-Array, you want to keep in mind that there are two main data structures. Uh, it's the data set and 
from reading the documentation to be more specifically, it's a data set is kind of an uh, in-memory representation of a NetCDF file. And um, I'm gonna look down for a second. A data, uh, data array is kind of a, I believe it's uh, described as a wrapper around a NumPy array that uses label dimensions and um, coordinates to support uh, operations. Um, that's, of course, very abstract, but I'm going to show you in a second, especially when I come to show how to essentially do like one-liner uh, visualizations with NetCDF files. Um, so we import our X-Array uh, uh, library, and we use an alias just to make things easier. And then we import our NetCDF file from our path where the file is stored. Um, I just showed, uh, printed out the type, um, and just, see it, just to show that we have the data set. As I was describing, it's an in-memory representation of a NetCDF file. Um, and then we print it out. Um, so if you are interested, you, after the webinar, you can go back and you can see what the printout of what uh, X-Array looks like in comparison to NetCDF 4. Um, like before, we print out the variables. Stuff looks kind of similar, um, at, which it should be as it's the same file. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're just going to hop in to start visualizing a NetCDF file. Um, so we're going to access the last uh, uh, value from the um, from the C surface. Uh, we're going to access the um, values uh, from the the variable. Um, yeah, from the uh, from the file, the variable, and then we're going to access the long, uh, longitudinal values from the variable directly using uh, that NumPy uh, index, uh, uh, NumPy uh, indexing or slicing indexing or, uh, notation. And now we are going to access the sea surface temperature um, data as well using the NumPy array index. Uh, slicing or uh, notation. And so, like before, we just did this simple uh, operation, to ch operation, these operations to check the mean, the standard deviation, and the size. And they come out as the same. Um, and you can go back up uh, after the webinar to check. Um, and so now we're going to plot this. Um, again, we're only getting the first date of of the file, we're not going to plot all eight dates. That would that would probably that would involve some subplotting. Um, and so what we do here, in this case, I wanted to show everybody how to do a change the color map. Um, and so what I did is I set the color map as a variable. I think I believe somebody was asking about color mapping. And so here I explicitly set it. Um, and so um, this should look familiar by now, but the difference is we're doing it with a NetCDF file um, with, and with CardoPy. And so we use a contour plot. And so we set the values, the long values, the lat values, the sea surface temperature values. Um, and then we put the color map. Um, argument in there. And then we're going to plot it as a plate curry. Um, and we have our color bar as well. Um, I just set the color bar to kind of, you know, show more, add more value to the plot. And we're also um, adding, you know, the temperature, the min and the max as well. And so we run that. Um, I ran it earlier, but just wanted to run again. And so there we go. Um, we get this plot here from a NetCDF file. And so what I want to do is show you while you could, um, while this may be, while it may need a few more things, uh, I would probably think a title, uh, the date, 
um, I, I changed it to markdown not code. I want to show how to plot this uh, essentially in one line. It's not as pretty, but it may be for um, maybe useful for quick checking. Um, so, and it also showed the other aspect. We've primarily been just kind of showing um, small portions of um, like simple ways to access uh, dimensions, variables, and um, uh, of a NetCDF file. So what I'm going to show you is a um, how to plot, do a one-line plot, and um, and it's also going to show you another method, um, another method of another way of how to select. Uh, how to subset uh, data. Um, so what we're doing is using in, uh, is cell, which is basically a way to um, select the first um, filter or subset on uh, dimensions within um, a NetCDF file using X-Array. And so as you see, oh, I should say, uh, oh, I know what I did wrong. I used, so as you see, I'm, I have got the first um, date of um, sea surface temperature dimension. And so what I will do now is I will plot this. And while it does not look that nice, um, while it looks okay, what we can do is uh, filter uh, filter out the values that only show you know the um, uh, we can make it a discrete plot by this um, it's hard to read a second piece of paper and um, type at the same time um, so let's see so what we're doing here is we're only um, we're filtering out some of these, uh, some of the values, like uh, some of the the lower, uh, uh, what is it? We're only showing like the top, uh, the the second and the 98 percentile values. So as you see, um, uh, these values update here, and the values. Are, are very different here. And if we want a, a plot that plot the colors to be more discrete, uh, oh, there we go. It looks a little a little better for kind of a quick uh, a quick plot. And with this method, I don't have it on hand. There's documentation, but it's not really a good way to have a webinar me looking at documentation in real time and doing trial and errors, but I I can provide everybody with documentation of how to do essentially subplot, you know, in sequence a uh, series of dates, um, which I would imagine be very helpful. Um, so while this was kind of a basic overview of using uh, Python, uh, using Python to access uh, NetCDF files. I didn't really do any kind of manipulation because I think this might be a little bit out of my scope, but I do want to, so that's the end of the coding portion. I do want to point out some additional aspects about X-Ray X -ray and um, other additional uh, related libraries that may be potentially of use for anybody looking to get into um, utilize this information. Um, so, Iris is um, a library that allow a mapping library that integrates with X-Array and CardoPy. And specific, excuse me about that. <laughs> it allows you to uh, it integrates with uh, CF conventions, so it will interpret files. Um, I would recommend um, that have CF convention information. I would. Uh, Suggest you check out that um, link directly. The documentation is linked here, and then, of course, as 
NetCDF files can be huge, and um, one of the advantages of X-Array that it go over is that you could pull in multiple NetCDF files and read them, and you could um, run uh, operations on, um, like, you could use, so thinking of that, you could use Dask to um, carry out uh, uh, load information out of memory so and do lazy loading so essentially you won't um you you'd actually be able to carry out uh, operations in a manageable uh, manner and then cm oceans uh it's a package specifically for color maps for commonly used oceanographic information um and uh, the reason i didn't actually i and ask anybody to install this stuff is that, you know, again, it's a little bit, it's out of my scope, and it's also, I don't want to um, ask people to install 10, 15 packages and then use a package for a single example. And, you know, it's, it just seems a lot to have people go through for a little bit. And so I will, if anybody has any questions, um, But um, if, it looks like nobody has any questions. Um, I will just go over the resources again. Siphon, I, documentation, uh, Unidata. Um, uh, I believe it is a notebook that goes over uh, how to access uh, sources, resources. Um, which one of the uh, ways to access information is. You don't again. You don't have to directly download it. You could um, you could remotely access it and then subset uh, that data and then download that NetCDF data, which uh, would be it's a nice idea. Um, NetCDF four documentation um, and there's uh, although this I did advertise that there would be writing of NetCDF files. I'm going to show why. I'm not going to do that because it's a lot of um, there's there's a lot that goes into actually writing a NetCDF file and there's um, a lot of it, it would probably take up more than an hour so I would ask that anybody interested in learning about writing NetCDF files um, I did provide that information for writing NetCDF files. That's for both NetCDF 4 and X-Array. There are two specific um, Unidata uh, resources, and they're pretty thorough, and they do have that um, domain expertise uh, there that guides you through it. Um, again, we have a LibGuide for Python and then Commerce Learning Center. And um, we finished fairly early in this notebook um, if anybody has any questions or does not, I think we may wrap this up really early, um, 40 minutes earlier um, than scheduled. But um, I think it's, I think we're good to go then. Yes, and um, we will. Um, I will follow up with feedback. If you don't have any questions now, um, you can email me, and then I have a document that I'm already working on, and I will email um, everybody, um, whether they attended the first uh, session, the second session, or both sessions with that document. And I should have that back sometime next week. And it's, it looks like we have a question. Um, Oh, all right. Thank you guys very much. Um, and everybody have a good weekend. Bye-bye.